Um, hi everyone. So I hope you don't mind English here. Um, let's start with a small poll. Um, who's using Python more for a data analytics than programming? And who's, who's using Python more for programming than data analytics? Okay. I think I hope I will not bore you the second second group because I'll I'll be speaking more about the data analytics here. So I'm Peter. Uh, I'm living ten years in Prague where I. Uh, uh, work as a business analyst and data analyst and programmer. Um, two years ago, I co-founded a company called Stories. Uh, Stories is a software for a business which uh, tries to help them understand what's going on in their company and what's causing this. So this is the reason of the presentation, which I call the machine search for meaning, because we are really building the analytics or a search engine, which is searching a huge amount of a company's data and trying to explain everything for them. So I'm not sure if you noticed, but the last year, every time I open the TechCrunch, Twitter, or LinkedIn, uh, everywhere I see like how AI is going to revolutionize the world and uh, how um, you know people will lose jobs because they, uh, you know, there will be robots. But then I look in my office and I saw 15 of my colleagues, right, in, in a company. And basically, what we have been doing was we were sitting there. And there were our colleagues, our managers, or our customers coming to us and showing us the Excels and saying, hey, can you figure out why this number is red? So we fired up our machines, we opened our Tableaus and R's and Jupyter Notebooks and crunched data for a week. And then we came with a presentation and they say, uh, we don't care about this number anymore. We have another problem right now. So I was really frustrated because you know I saw a lot of clever people sitting in the room and we spent it. 80% of our time just crunching the numbers and 90%, 95% of time, it was meaningless, right? I'm a lazy person from the nature. So I said, hey, uh, there needs to be a way how uh, I can automatize this 80% of my tedious work and you know, spend my time more eff uh, effectively explaining data to my colleagues or to my managers or to my clients, right? So we have been thinking last two years with my co-founders and with my team, you know, how to figure it out. And we spent one year by building the pilot of the companies or the search engine we called Stories. Um, and then last year and last summer, we actually got a seed funding of around 15 million check rounds of $600,000 or euros um, to bring this to the market. So in the last seven months, we have been working, uh, we have been working as a company. We have a five clients right now and around 15 pilot, pro uh, pilot projects. Uh, so what's the stories? Uh, so we are trying, after 30 years of business uh, using the Excel, we are trying to figure out something better, right? We are trying to explain and uh, everyone in the company, for each person, create a personalized dashboard saying, these are the top priorities you have to focus on today based on the data. And this is the reason why is this happening, right? So we have the analytics and the reporting part, which is saying, What's important for you that particular day, right? Why is this happening and who's responsible? So who should take some action? And of course, then once we figure out this, we don't want to be as a normal reporting tool. So the people then, you know, they bring up their phones or they go to another office and they start discussing it. But we want to keep that people in the, our application, right? And let them collaborate there. So we can collect more data about the decision they made and the actions they took so we can have more data to learn from and suggest them a better solution in the future, right? So this is stories. Um, the right part is very interesting too, but it's more about the business and UX. The left part is more about the Python and data analytics. So I'll focus more on the left part today. Um, if you still um, cannot imagine what it is, uh, I sometimes uh, try to make it very simple and say it's like Excel plus Slack. Right, so in Excel, you finish with a cell. You see the number in the cell. Um, and in our application and stories, it starts with a cell. So you see the number, but each number is a story which has some updates, which has some notifications, which has some explanation inside. Right. So um, just a few few simple slides how it looked like. We started with this, which is the list of ten priorities when the user opens the applications. These are the top stories uh, in your business which you should really focus on. Um, but the lesson learned was um, it's, it's a huge mind shift for people, right? So they, cannot, they, they, they didn't understand the list. So 
this is a nice user experience maybe uh, issue. So we figure out, oh, we have to bring them to something which looks more like an Excel. So we actually change our application a little bit. It looks more like an Excel. They are very satisfied, but they still have the advantages. They have a notification, what's important, where you should focus and what you should not care about this week or today, right? And then if you click on the cell, you have notifications, you have updates, uh, uh, or you can see the whole stories, right? Where you can collaborate, where you see the explanation. This is the, this is the bottom part where you see the textual description of what's going on. You have uh, um, your colleagues, which you can invite and you can collaborate, right? And then we use the data to um, learn which actions actually lead to some improvement and which was basically useless, right? So this is, uh, this is the end of the product description. Let's go to the programming. Um, actually, uh, everyone in the co-founding team and all our first employees, no one, was a, no one of us was a programmer. Right, so we start like a data analyst and business analyst guy who can work with the ETL tools, who can script in R and do a little bit Python, but we never thought we will actually build something in Python. We say, oh, let's use the tools we know, you know, to build this. But we very quickly figure out uh, it's impossible, right? Because we have to, we need to do a lot of custom things, which, you know, these ETL tools or R is not sufficient. So I have been looking for a tool I can use um, and which can bring me all the benefits, right? So I can do the some generic programming inside. I can do some data analytics. I can Okay, we can, we can continue right now. So um, this, is everything, uh, this is everything we use Python the, uh, this day for. I can speak about every of this point a lot, but I just decided I will pick a few things today and I try to you know, describe you how we think about the problem, what are kind of the problems we have to solve and why we, we actually did the company, right? So the, th the two things are uh, data analytics and pandas. So how we use pandas to do the analytics on a huge number of data and how we leverage a graph databases, namely Network X. And then if we have some uh, remaining time, we can um, speak a little bit about how we scale it. Because we, again, we were a data analyst, so we wrote a very not optimal solution at the, first, uh, at the beginning, and then we had to you know, scale it, um, which is a little, uh, which is a little uh, difficult for non-programmers. Um, so when you uh, wanna architect something like this as a system which, uh, takes the data and converts it into the stories, uh, we said the best architecture would be if we design it the same way as the data analyst thinks, right? So I take a data or a report, I take a look at it, I analyze it, then I evaluate it, then I find the explanations, then I present it to someone, right? So there, there's a number of steps you have to take to go from the raw data to the stories. And we took the same approach with the uh, with our own application. So we, we basically build the data pipeline or the workflow which suits us our, our, our best. So the first problem is uh, I need to figure out what's the most important in the company, right? But um, usually the businesses we serve, uh, they are very stable, right? They are large businesses. Uh, and on the aggregated level, somewhere on the top, right? Their, perform their performance is stable or it's slowly growing or slowly declining. But nothing interesting is going on there. What's, go, uh, what's interesting is what's going on inside when you look deeper into the data, right? But I, as a data analyst, can do, let's say, 30 analysis per hour, right? But uh, the large companies we, ha we saw, they had like 300,000 signals per day, right? So they have a lot of combinations how you can look at the data. And we didn't want to miss it. So we say, let's do the brute force. Let's generate every possible combination, every possible report or view. I can take a look at it then analyze it and then figure out if something important is going there or not, right? So we use some, we took some ITER tools and col uh, collections and we really generate the metadata for every possible view 
or report, let's say, uh, which can be generated from the gate uh, from the data. Of course, there are some rules and there are some exceptions, which um, is out of the scope of today's presentation. But at the end, you get a list of all the possible combinations of the data you're able to analyze. So the second problem is if how to analyze it, right? I have a 300,000 views which I need to analyze. If I'm non-human, I will just take a, some analyst. I will, you know, open their eyes and I will say, oh, so I will be flashing in front of your eyes a lot of reports and you will be telling me if there's something going on or not. But that's not very human. So uh, we said, let's leverage pandas and let's run every report through some standard analysis. And over the time we figure out there is around 10 or 12 possible scenarios which can happen in a time series data, right? I didn't put a name, uh, names in these charts because I consider this to be a lot of uh, internal know-how know of our company. But basically this is a few examples of what can happen with the data. And we've wrote, for each of the situation, we wrote our own dedicated pattern, as we call it, right? Which identifies uh, if this situation is going on in the data or it's not happening in the data. Right? It was, and there was another problem because I have a lot of um, colleagues who came from, you know, from our back, uh, background or they were used to analyze data the way that they, they saw the view or they saw the input data and they know there is a number of rows and there is a number of columns and there is a seasonality in this data and this is the sparsity of the data. But in our case, you don't know what kind of data you get because you get one of 300,000 sl uh, slices, right? So. It can be this sparsity, it can have one row, it can have 15 rows, it can have one mm, column, it can have 20 columns, right? So this was a huge mind shift for us to figure out how we should write this analysis and pandas to be able to adjust to any possible data you can get, right? But eventually you have library of 12 patterns, which you apply to all 300,000, you know, slices. And basically they make the decision if there is something going on in the data, if there, one of the patterns was identified, or not, right? So basically they're just doing the separation. Nothing going on, nothing interesting going on here. Nothing interesting going on here. Oh, there's something interesting going on here, right? The green one. So I'll mark it as a story and then I can work with it farther. So we took, it took us our, around half hour, uh, half, half a year to build it, right? And then we were satisfied with the results that it actually showed us, oh, um, there are cells declining somewhere let's say in Koshitsa, right? So there are cells declining in Koshitsa. And we were, we were very satisfied with the, uh, with the results because we saw, oh, we have an engine which can identify if something interesting is going on in data. But we run it, we took, a, uh, we took a look at our stories in a list like this, and then we were shocked like, oops. Um, but it seems that it also identified that cells, cells are declining in Presho and in Jelena and in Bratislava and actually in whole Slovakia, right? So, there were a lot of very similar stories. And then we figure out, hmm, actually each signal, it's not a separated item in the company, right? But they are connected somehow uh, to each other, right? So the cost is a negatively influenced by the margin or, you know, the Košice is actually the hierarchical child of Slovakia and so on and so on. So there are connections between all the signals. Right? So we have been thinking out how we should put all these separate stories together to figure out where's actually the root cause uh, you know, of this problem. Um, and we, we, we can try a lot of different things, right? We try to iterate over all the stories and, and, and find a solution, but it was very time consuming. Um, and then we figure out, oh, it, it is actually a graph, right? So I can build the graph of all the stories and then I can evaluate that graph to figure out where's the root, right? So I take a look at cells in Slovakia and then I say give me all the children and it gives me it returns me all the children very quickly right and then I see are all the ch uh, then I can ask the question are all the children behaving similar to the parent if yes I know that the root cause is a parent if not then I know that the root cause is somewhere between the children right and um, I found the network X uh, library which I, I which I think is is great and it, ha and it um, saved a lot of us a lot of time right because we basically very quickly build the graph of the whole company, and then we can just run the query against that graph, uh, like I mentioned before, right? Um, at one, and at one moment in our in time, our uh, designer sit down with one of our analysts and they actually put together this. This is the graph of the real company, you know, how it looks like. So all the stories are uh, linked together. And then we just run the, run the, run the queries against that graph. 
you can you can use it to figure out the explanations and finding the risk causes. You can also um, use it for another interesting things like when you figure out that the organization structure of the company is actually also the graph and you merge these two graphs together, you can figure out who should be responsible for each of that stories, right? But again, this is also probably out of scope of today's presentation. So, so this was the this was the third component we, we put into the, into this data pipeline, and there is uh, more and more components which uh, unfortunately I cannot mention today because that's a lot of them. But then we run it through the NLTK to generate the text description of the story, and we parse the we parse the expressions using pipersing and so on. We add charts, and at the end, what you what the user see at the beginning uh, uh, in the application is something like this, right? So this is the story, but there is no human input into this, right? Everything is generated by the machine, right? So the description, the chart, uh, the, all the markers in the graph, all the explanations, this is, this is um, automatically generated by the machine. So right now I saved 80% of my time and I can go and I can be very effective with this one because I can just go to my customers or to my managers and my clients or colleagues who are in sales and start working with them on the stories. But I don't do any manual work with analyzing and pre-processing the data. <clears throat> what was interesting was um, we devel I, I developed this on my Le uh, Lenovo T400 laptop um, as a data analyst used to, right? So I had a 20 megabyte uh, sample. We built it for one year and then we wanted to test it on our first customer, right? So I told my my, my colleague to you know spin up some a AWS machines and run the large larger data around 300 megabytes or 400 megabytes, which was the last two years of their cells, somehow aggregated, right? And we wait all night and in the morning I had a Slack message saying, oh, it ran for 21, uh, 21 uh, hours and 16 hours it was just saving data into the database and it's somewhere in the middle generated two gigabytes of metadata, <laughs> right? So it wasn't very, uh, it wasn't very optimal. We figure out, oh, we have another issues. We have to behave more like the programmers. We have to start thinking about the effect effectiveness of the code we are using, right? Because we didn't care that the NumPy and Scikit-Learn, they, they both have a regression function, but one is 0 0.3 seconds faster. But when you apply that on a 300,000 slices, there's a lot of time you can actually save. Or you, you should be more, uh, you know, you should think more about the memory. Because if you have one story which saves, uh, 100 kilobytes of data is okay, but if you have 300,000 stories, that's, that's a lot of, mem uh, that's a lot of um, things you have to keep in the memory. Another problem was, this is, uh, this is in Slovak, but when I searched yesterday in our Slack, uh, the world spadlo, which is like uh, the client or the machine failed, I found 49 uh, results. Right, so we had a lot of issues that the data pipeline was, uh, was too long. We, we run it as a one script. And when someone made a mistake or they, they didn't assume that the view will actually look like this and it failed, we, we, you know, we lose 10 hours of a processing time. And if you multiply it by 50, which is probably the number of time it, uh, it, this occurred, that's a, lot of, you know, that's a lot of wasted time. So we have to start thinking about how we should scale it, how we can, uh, you know, how we can run this in parallel, how we can um, make it more fault, fault tolerant, how we can write it more, optim you know, more optimal. And basically, we had a few approaches we wanted to try. So, and the first first thing which came to your mind, if you if you're on the startup, is oh, I should develop something on my own, right? So, I should write my own monitoring um, solution. I'll just build a new API. I, I I put some salary workers together. You know, I'll, I'll put a small front end on on top of it, and I'll have everything. I have a ni nice cockpit. How this how this can uh, look like, and how how this can work. It's it's not very effective for a startup. We spent a, probably three or four months building this, and we never ended. Um, so <clears throat> we decided we will have to try something else. And um, we have been using a lot of AWS uh, machines. So some consultants from AWS, they actually called us to Prague and they said, oh, we want to give you a visit and we want to provide you some free consultancy, right? So how you, should, how you should do it properly. So they came to us, we explained them what kind of problems we have. Um, and they said, oh, there's a, there's a new service called, you know, serverless computing, uh, AWS Lambda, you should just put your patterns and um, all your functions into Lambda, you will just send their, the request and they will respond to you if this is a story or not. So we said, oh, this looks pretty pretty nice, we should definitely try it. 
So they, they came on Monday, they started helping us developing this, and their first question was, so what are the variables in the, in, in the pattern? And we say, okay, so there is a small configuration JSON, and then there is a JSON with the metadata describing the, the, the slice you have to generate, and then the third variable is data. And they said, oh, data. So this is not very good for Lambda because Lambda doesn't have any internal storage, so you have to send all the data along the HTTP request to the Lambda, right, so it can produce uh, some results and respond. So this is not very effective if you have to do it 300 time, uh, thousand times. Right? So we, we very quickly figure out, okay, Lambda is not for uh, heavy data analytics tasks. It, it has some advantages when you want to process the HTTP request or you want to do some API call, but not for data analytics. So they suggested, okay, so we said this is also not a good way to go. So they suggested another solution, which is AV, AWS Data Pipeline. It seems very promising at the beginning because you can build your own data pipelines inside the AWS infrastructure. So you have the integration with S3 um, and everything, you know, you have your own images, which you build in uh, AWS available. So it seems very promising. And we figure out we can solve a lot of issues there. Like we can save a results after each step. So if something fails, we can just respin the machines and start, uh, start, uh, start where, where it failed or, you know, when we are developing a new component, which is 13 in the row, we don't have to run 12 components, but we can save the data after 12 components and then just reiterate on the 13 component. But um, the problem with the data pipeline was actually, first, the AWS is not very heavily investing in, 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 this, in this particular product, right? So it, it lacks a really nice and effective user, inter, uh, user interface for monitoring. You can run only a limited number of instances at the moment, so you cannot really do any parallelization, right? Because they limit you to uh, only 10 or 12 machines, you know, running in a, in a parallel and so on and so on. So we figured out, okay, this is probably a nice temporary solution, but it's still running very, uh, very long time because, because we, ca we cannot do our own parallelization. We, we don't have a very effective monitoring, so our consultants, they cannot, you know, they, they, they don't know what's going on actually with the data. And then someone came with a proposal to use the Airflow, which I'm not sure who of you knows Airflow, Apache Airflow right now. Okay, a few people. So um, it's a really nice, uh, this is a really nice open source uh, solution, a platform, originally I think from Airbnb, which is for programmatically, you know, defining, scheduling, and executing, executing workflows, right? So any workflow, but for me, it's a really nice data pipeline workflow. Um, so, what you can actually do is write a script which, defi which defines every component programmatically and then you can execute it in the platform, right? So this is the example of the, of, of the function that actually generates all of our components dynamically, right? And then, it, and then it looks something like this, right? So I define everything in my code and eventually I get a subduck, duck as a directed acyclic graph, right? So this is how they describe the pipeline. And I get the, I get the, the pipeline, which with every component we have, you can see the parallelization in the middle because there are some operations we can parallelize. These are the pandas patterns, which, we, which, which, can, which can run in parallel. And then they, can, then they are put together back before they are um, inserted into the graph because you cannot parallelize the graph, right? You have to, you have, to have only one graph to find out the explanations. Right, so it's a really nice solution. You can schedule these pipelines. You can monitor these pipelines because you see, you know, what's going on. Where is the problem? You can. It has a very uh, good logging, you know, um, solution. So this is the this is the solution we are using right now for you know for running all of our data pipelines for 15 clients, and it's really nice. So um, I'm thinking if I have anything else there, probably not. So if you have any questions, I'm not sure how much time we have four minutes so if you have any questions feel free to ask or I'll you can you can stop me by outside so thank you very much Peter uh, there are some questions on Slido the first one is what did your designer and analyst use to get um, generate that huge graph of stories in the company um, I'm thinking what's the so we exported a network X graph into GraphML, uh, and then they use some some open source software. But I'm not 100% sure what was the name. Okay. Uh, 
I'll, you, I'll can figure you can out later. You can contact him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Let us know and we'll we'll figure out it. It was a nice solution. Yeah. Uh, have you tried combination with R programming language? Uh, no, because yeah. we wanted to we wanted to have everything in a in a sing on a single platform on a single code base. Um, what's really nice about the pandas is that it mimics the syntax and logic of R. Right. So there was a some overhead at the beginning when our analysts they needed to learn and switch from from R to Python, but right now it doesn't make any sense for us to um, do anything in R because everything is covered in Python. Okay, thank you. And you said you are data analyst. So how many hours do you spend with programming? Um, uh, in the meantime, uh, of uh, founding this company, I had to become something like a programmer, intermediate programmer, because we didn't have a lot of programmers at the beginning. Our first programmer actually joined in the seventh month, seventh month of our uh, of, of the origin of the company, right? So for first seven months, it was only uh, only analysts. Um, right now, I spend some time programming, but we have a team of twelve or fifteen developers, which are more skilled than me. So I'm I'm stick with the product management and. Uh, doing an interim CTO. And did you consider finding interesting stories top to bottom, starting at the root of the graph and only evaluating children if their parent seems interesting? Uh, yeah, this is a solution. Every time we say we, we have a problem with the performance, someone suggests yeah, you should look only on the top and then if there's something happening, you should analyze it below. But the problem is, um, as I said, if you look at a stable company, uh, and on their sales, you would say, okay, nothing is happening on the level zero, so I should, it doesn't make any sense to drill down. But the problem is that when you drill down, there is something, hap something interesting going on. So we really have to do every combination. We really have to look at every combination to, to figure out if something interesting going on or not. The very last question, are you hiring? Yeah, we are still hiring. Okay, thank you very much.